Good afternoon. We are now live. Welcome back to Vermont House Judiciary Committee. And we are continuing our discussions on uh, bills that are currently in the committee. Uh, this afternoon, we'll be looking at H18. And uh, we're waiting for Legislative Council to give us a walkthrough on that. Uh, I did want to go back to this morning on um, H18. I'm sorry, H20. Um, and I want to thank um, Representative Tom Burdett for uh, sitting in as, as chair. I was listening to both of my meetings at the, at the same time, and I uh, um, appreciate the conversation and the uh, concerns that, that came up um, about um, H20, and it, it shows that really nothing is simple, no matter how technical or um, simple we think a bill is, uh, they're always often other, other questions. And so I appreciated the, um, the questions. So what I've, um, I've asked Mike to do is to um, get back to this on Tuesday afternoon and, and hear from uh, James Pepper, who we didn't have a chance to hear from David Scher, um, invite Willa again and Judge Grierson. And, uh, and then after that, see where we, where we are. Cause I know that there was some discussion about um, after hearing some of the Defender General that it kind of made more sense, it fell into place. I know that um, certainly the larger question of risk assessments and how they're used and how reliable they are um, and the inherent bias, um, that's a much larger discussion. It's a very important discussion. Um, one that we certainly should, if we do wanna go down that road, we certainly should um, speak to the Institutions Committee. And I would speak to the chair of that, that committee because that certainly is, um, the jurisdiction of uh, the institutions committee. So what I'd like to do is Tuesday, let's get some more testimony, see where we're at and, um, and, and proceed from, from there. Um, does that make sense to folks who are actually there, unlike me? <laughs> um, see a thumbs up from Martin, from Tom, I see a bunch of, okay, great. Barbara, yeah, go ahead. So the one um, other group, and I can check in offline with them, is I was curious about the ACLU. Yeah. Because they've yeah. been vocal in Colorado about concerns with risk assessments. I know, and I do have them. I, I did jot them down. And I, I again, if we, if we dive deeper into this, then that might be a time when we do that, have that discussion with, um, with institutions, but we can, um, again, we can think about it. We could also, if we want to report back or if we want to study, you know, there, there are many ways we can, we can go right. beyond the language of, of this bill. But yeah, thank you. <coughs> Tom. Yeah, not that I'm advocating for, for us to do it, but um, why, why would that go to institutions? Well, I think, I don't know if it would go to institutions or if, um, but certainly risk assessments, um, depart, um, uh, corrections, right? Department of Corrections, oh, yeah. um, certainly within um, institutions. Right. Jurisdiction. I would say they have primary jurisdiction over institutions. Yep. So it doesn't mean we can't look at it also, but um, but certainly that's something that uh, the Chairwoman Emmons would would um, you know need to know about and um, sure, and it may be something that they're already looking at. You know, certainly Justice Reinvestment too um, has been looking at those issues. So, so that's all okay. I'm thinking. Yep. So. Great, thank you. Yep. Sure. Um, okay. Anybody else? Yeah, if I just follow up with uh, Tom as well is. <clears throat> I think it's as much for consistency. If we're uh, pushing back on use of risk assessment in the courts and for pretrial and all those things, and over in institutions, they're gung ho for it. And I don't know that that's the case. Uh, I, I'd hate to have that kind of inconsistency as far as the message from the legislature on the role of risk assessment. So that's why I think kind of a broad look and possibly bringing in institutions, well, definitely bringing them in if, if in fact, we're going to take such a broad look. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, okay. And I'm hoping, I know Mike is working on a uh, 
a joint meeting with Senate Judiciary for next week to hear the uh, to hear the report. Uh, racial, I was RDAP, right? Racial disparities. Somebody help me in the juvenile. <laughs> Yeah. Advisory Thank panel, race, right. Thank the, you. the short yeah, is racial disparities advisory panel. It's a right. much longer official name. Right, right. So, um, so that'd be great if we can if we can do that. Um, it'd be great to have Aton and others um, speak to us. And so, so stay tuned. That's, that. Coach, that's a go. It's a go. Okay. Yes. Great. Great. Yeah. Thank you. We'll be hosting it. Okay. Oh, we're hosting it? Okay. Yeah. I'll talk to Senator Sears about that. Okay, good. And I thought I saw Coach's hand up, right, Coach? Hi. Uh, no, I, I think we... Okay. I, Coach, I can't hear you. Uh... Coach, you're muted. There you uh, go. It, the thing is, when you hover over that button, it keeps <laughs> going back and forth, back and forth. But anyways, got to love the technology. Sometimes it's better to just hold the uh, the space bar uh, because that that does the same thing. Um, I think that uh, Martin uh, covered it, uh, you know, pretty well as far as uh, integrating that discussion uh, with corrections. Um, it just seems to make sense if we go that deep uh, in the dive. One of the other things that came up during the discussion was clarity uh, within the section, because right now, when you first read it, you really can't tell it's specifically about bail. You know, uh, you know, what's the purpose, you know, so uh, so that was one of the things. But we're going to save some questions we had for uh Mr. Eric. Right, and, and also I think it'll be helpful hearing from uh, David Sheriff, the Attorney General's office, um, as well as uh, some of the other witnesses that we didn't get to today. So, uh, Judge Griers Grierson was uh, one that came up too. Yeah, yeah, so hopefully we'll hear from, um, from Judge Grierson and the others on Tuesday, but I'm gonna hold off mm. with the um, uh, commissioner of of corrections or ACLU or, yeah. or some of the other folks that we would hear about if we were going to take a, a deeper dive. So, okay, I see people are coming on. I don't see Michelle yet, but hopefully uh, soon. Maxine, she, she sent us an email saying that she had child pickup duty between one and two, so she could be on right after that. I just remembered that. And I've sent her a text message saying that we're ready when she is, but. Okay. Uh, let me think for a minute. Um, so Michelle is gonna do a, a walkthrough of the actual bill. I do see that Matthew Raymond is here. We, we, so we could pivot and uh, go maybe have Matthew um, Matt talk to us now, because we, I rushed, I rushed him the other day, um, but sort of give us more context about these cases, uh, why this bill is needed, uh, sort of a general overview. And then, um, then when Michelle is available, we could, we could go back and do a, a walkthrough of the bill if that, if that works for, for folks and for, for Matt Raymond, it works for you? Yes, that's fine with me. Okay, great, thank you. Appreciate your, your flexibility. Thank you so much. So welcome. Hi, right. thank you. Again, it's Matt Raymond. I'm the commander of the Vermont Internet Crimes Against Children Task Force. Um, and uh, last week, I believe it was, I gave an intro to the task force and what we do. Um, one of the biggest uh, amounts of investigations that we do are regarding uh, child sexual abuse material. And in some of that um, stuff that seems like it would be obviously criminal um, is it was missing um, from the previous definitions. And that's um, most of the time, it's gonna sound horrendous to say, but a, a lot of the images surround very, very young uh, girls, uh, you know, three and four year old girls um, that are right in front of um, um, 
they're dressed, but they're in front of a male who's nude and his erect penis is right in front of the girl's mouth. Um, and it's obvious that it's uh, about to contact and what's about to happen. But that uh, simulated um, oral contact is not uh, covered in the bill or covered in the current uh, law. And it's also sometimes from the camera angle, um, it looks like there's contact, but we couldn't swear there's contact. And so unless there's contact under the current definition, um, then it's kind of a legal loophole. Um, and uh, we were trying to close that. Uh, this was part of uh, the bill last year, I think with different uh, language, um, that uh, this is the only part that didn't, uh, of what we really wanted that didn't make it. Um, so that's what we're, we're trying to get. Um, so we get a lot of these uh, reported from cyber tips and we, the, these cases are just exploding with numbers of cases. Um, and the other trend is we're just seeing younger and younger uh, children. Uh, I alluded to the fact of uh, two uh, very disturbing trends we saw this last year were uh, a, a marked increase in um, infant and toddler sexual abuse of material and um, with also sextortion cases. So this would obviously help in a form of you know, child sexual abuse. So I don't know if there's specific questions regarding that or Tom and Barbara. How you doing, Mac? Good to see you, Commander. Um, you, you may not remember, and, and I certainly know, that's why I'm asking the question. Is there a difference in the language from last year um, compared to this year? And uh, if, if you don't have that, that information, it's fine. I'm sure Michelle will, but. Um, I think uh, David would have that information better than me. I, I believe there is a change in the language that we asked for this year and uh, that we made it um, very similar to the language that exists in New York State uh, because it's already been a tested law. Uh, oh. but da David can speak uh, a lot more intelligently about that uh, side of it. Right, okay. And, and uh, more on a personal note, I, I got a, um, an, uh, an email from my son this morning and the, the headline, it, it was him and his team, the former Seattle Seahawks security manager charged with possession of child pornography um you know thought he was talking to a 13 year old twenty five thousand images and i mean you know probably the, the same old same old as far as stories go but a uh, pretty pretty high high profile bust out in seattle yeah unfortunately it's really hard to this goes through all walks of life uh, we've arrested <laughs> police officers teachers um, you know, very prominent people all the way down to the, you know, unemployed or homeless, you know, so yep. homeless people on the free government provided phone, um, which is obviously not, not an easy case, but, um, but yeah, so there's no predictor on who's going to be involved. In right. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Barbara, do you have a, a question for Matt or, okay, great. And then we'll turn to Michelle. Thank you. So Matt, I forget from last year, I, I remember um, the issue that you presented us with, but were, are you able to not charge that person with anything serious? Like you can charge them with endangerment or so, but not sort of assault? So if they're not the person depicted in the image, right? They're, they have a image of somebody else. Um, and they've not shown it to a kid and they've just possessed it themselves, there would be nothing like, that I know of we could charge them with. Um, um, it would be a, a loophole. I don't think anybody intended that not to fit the definition of child pornography because I could tell you there's very heinous pictures to look at. Um, but uh, sadly, uh, there's a lot of them out there. And um, again, I think it was just a legal loophole in there. But for that scenario, there's nothing else we can charge. So but people, the image. people have walked away when that's like you um well our fear is that that can happen um, okay we've been pretty lucky that we've been able to you know if if we get a cyber tip and that's the only image we can't accept that cyber tip for investigation so in that regard yes people have gotten away with it wow. because I, I can't i have to be able to to get a subpoena for their ip address right the, the first leg of developing who somebody is i have to say a crime has been committed 
Now, I can't say that a Vermont crime has been committed when that doesn't fit the definition. So in that case, yes, people have been. Um, once we've gotten to the search warrant phase, uh, obviously we've had other images that have uh, got us there. Uh, so if there's a multi-image case, then we've been able to get around it's, by having another image, but that's not always the case. It's, that seems incredibly compelling as a rationale for this bill. So I just wanted to make sure I understood. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Okay, not seeing any hands. Okay. Well, thank you. And and certainly we can hear from you again after we hear from, from Michelle if there are other questions. Okay, welcome. Good afternoon, Michelle. Thank you. Oh. Great. Sorry, I'm a few minutes late. Nope. Yep. Absolutely. Juggling the, the kids picking up at school and you know, trying to work from home, all of that sort of stuff. So yeah. um, so I'm gonna just kind of set you up for the discussion with the witnesses and give you a little bit of foundation. So those of you who were on the committee last year already have some familiarity with it, but I know we've got some new folks. And, um, and so I wanna make sure everybody can feel like they aren't kind of just dropped in in the middle of the conversation without the, without the information that they need really to be considering the policy differences. Because um, while this is a, simple bill in the sense that it is very short. There's not a lot of language there. It's very complex from a constitutional standpoint. And there's a lot of issues in there for you uh, to, to discuss and to weigh. And the two witnesses uh, are, have differing viewpoints on that. And so what I wanna do is kind of set you up to, to have a basic understanding of the issue so that you can hear from the witnesses. And then when you circle back around for, co for committee discussion, I can join you for that and, and, and we can discuss the witness testimony as well. Um, so I am gonna, if it's okay with you, I'm gonna share the screen. Oh, I need to be, uh, Mike, I need to have the ability to share my screen. You're good now. Okay, thank you. I'm getting a little bit of something looking, looks a little different than, hmm. oh. Sorry. Let's start with this. Um, so for those of you, for the newer folks, I'll just mention, so I, I use, I have the green books, I can go to those all the time, but I use our online statutes directory all the time when I'm looking at things. And so I just wanted to show you where it is on here to give you familiarity. So if you wanna take a look, so I'm not just gonna spend a lot of time looking at the chapter overall, but I wanted you to know where it is. So if you wanna take a look at that when you have time. So we're working in title 13, so that's your, uh, your criminal title. We're gonna go down to chapter 64. And chapter 64 is the uh, chapter on sexual exploitation of children. And so uh, as you guys were discussing, there was legislation that passed last year that, um, that amended this chapter. Um, what's contained in this chapter, you see the different offenses. So you start out and you have- the Michelle, Michelle, I'm sorry, I don't mean yep. to interrupt, but I don't think that's what's on the screen right now. I think we're looking at a little background info for discussion of H1, H18. Did you mean that's to have the other I, huh. thank, thank you, Martin. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but-, but. No, thank you. Uh, I don't, hmm. You might have to unshare and then reshare to- Okay, uh, sorry about that. Um, let's see, stop share. Let me try again. Um, Still getting the same one I was on. No, you you got the right place now. You're, uh, now we're it's doing it. Title okay. 13, we're seeing, yeah. Okay, all right. Um, sorry about that. So uh, so looking at chapter 64, and you'll see in there, you see we have definitions, and then you have the different sections um, and the different statutes with regard to the different criminal offenses that are under this chapter. So this used to be, we think of this chapter as tends to be um, around the issue of what we were formerly calling child pornography, but which we now try to use the term uh, 
uh, child sexual abuse materials because pornography is something that indicates that there is consent um, involved between for the making of the, of the pornography and obviously there is no consent involved when we're talking about children and so we talk about sexual abuse, child sexual abuse materials. And, um, and so this is like, if you look at this, this was amended last year as part of the legislation that you passed. And so I just thought I'd bring up, uh, just for a little context, a little summary of what you passed last year for anybody who might have forgotten. Um, so there, they were kind of small changes, but substantive and, and Matt probably talked to you about some of those. So um, it expanded the definition of sexual conduct and sexual performance. Um, to include conduct by, with, or on a child. Um, it also updated uh, the definitions to include distribution through file sharing and peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, there was the name change, as I mentioned, um, and uh, some additions with regard to knowingly accessing um, that type of material with the intent to view. Um, and so that is now prohibited. And then the last part, which is why we're circling back around to this issue, is it required the attorney general uh, working with the defender general's office and the Department of State's attorneys and sheriffs to look at this issue of simulated sexual conduct um, uh, for the purpose of developing a clear, narrowly tailored legislative proposal that prohibits the conduct while ensuring that it's not sweeping in a substantial amount of constitutionally protected speech inadvertently. So I just wanted to kind of set you up for, um, for that. Um, something just I want to mention, and I don't think we need to go too much into it for our discussions today, but it will probably come up, is that when we are talking about this chapter, we're talking about these offenses as they apply to an actual child. So um, and the language in the individual statutes and the offenses because of the definition of, of child that's used in 2821, it's we're talking about a child under the age of 16. So none of these offenses would be applying to a, um, we've talked about a simulate, a, we're talking about simulations, it's not anime or you know, all the different technology that can be used to give the appearance of a child, but that it's, um, but it's actually not a, a, an actual real life child in that. So I just wanna kind of get that out there at the beginning because that is an important distinction. Um, and there was a case a number of years ago um, that had to do with that and, it, and, uh, and this, there are not, protect, while there are not protections for child sex abuse materials, um, that's not the case necessarily if you're talking about there wasn't an, an actual child involved, but there was a simulation pretending to be a child. So, um, so I wanted to mention that. Uh, Can I ask a question about that issue? Sure. Here, mm -hmm. um, when you well, when you get to the language, well, I guess you're getting there right now. It, I just didn't understand how that point you just made that it has to be an actual child. Where does where do I see that in this language? Right, um, and and that's you know, and I debated with AG's office a little bit about whether I need to try to bring it in, but if, if it's you look at, it's like you have to look at the context of the existing law and the statutory scheme. So if we, if we look at um, the definition in 2821 here and you see child means any person under 16 years of age. Okay, then let's go over and let's, you know, pick like uh, possession of child. So, um, and so when you see the word child in the statutes, you're talking about an actual child under the age of 16. You're not, you're not, it's not implicating that it's, uh, that it's anything other than that. So I think the existing statutory scheme is, is clear that it's not a, a, a drawing of a child, a, a um, things like that. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so if they wanted to go further than that, they would have to be explicit that they were looking at anime, as you said, or, or something that did not involve an actual child that would have to be explicit. Right. Right. So I, yes. In the statutory so, scheme. Right. Yep. Thanks.
Yeah. So, but I did, I, your point is well taken because I did consider about whether or not in the language in the bill, I wanted to say something about actual child, but it's, it's already implicit within the existing statute. So in my opinion. Um, so I'm gonna turn now to the, the language of um, H18 and look at that. And then I'm gonna move on to that other little document just with some, a little bit of background information and, um, and set you up for, for the witnesses. So, um, so if you look at the bill, you look at uh, page one, section one, and you'll see this definition section that we were just taking a look at. And so under the definition of sexual conduct, you have, you have this long laundry list there right now for what currently constitutes sexual conduct. Um, and so you can take a look at those things. And, um, and then on page two, you have this addition of the language on line nine in subdivision G, any simulation of the conduct described above. So it may not actually be, um, you know, one of those things, but it is a simulation of, of one of those things. Then you'll see right below that the definition of simulation means the explicit depiction of any conduct described up, up above that creates the appearance of such conduct and that exhibits the uncovered portion of the breasts, genitals, or buttocks. And uh, I can't remember if it was Tom, somebody asked the question of uh, whether, like what's different in this version versus last year. Um, and again, my recollection was that, you know, last year was such a weird t time of when we discussed stuff and then went back to stuff in the fall, but was that we didn't really discuss the simulation issue at either much or at all in the House and that it was raised more and discussed certainly in the Senate. And so when it came back to y'all, you, know, you weren't meeting as a committee anymore, things like that. And so you guys really didn't get into the nuts and bolts and have the constitutional you know, debate around simulation that the Senate had. Um, something that is different from last year before is that there's the added requirement that the simulation um, exhibits the uncovered portion of the breast, genitals, or buttocks. And that is something that was added um, to uh, narrow the scope. Um, so, because what you're trying to do is you are trying to um, prohibit a certain specific conduct as it applies to children, but you also want to limit any, con any constitutionally protected speech that you might unintentionally sweep in. And so the addition of the nudity part uh, was uh, one of the things that the Attorney General's office recommended be, uh, be added to narrow the scope. Excuse me, Tom, you have a question. Yes, thank you. And it was me, uh, Michelle. Um, so, on page two, line 12, number seven, the simulation. So the, the commander was describing uh, simulation to us, I'm gonna guess before you got on. And the, the uh, description that, that he used was, uh, you know, an erection close to uh, the mouth of a child, but not touching. Does that take that that scenario out when uh... no it's covered because they would be exposing the genitals oh okay I, I was I was applying that to the the juvenile no doesn't say whose genitals they have to be. If any genitals right, yeah. in the picture um, then then that simulation is covered okay yeah okay thank you sure. Okay, so we're gonna do a little con law 101 and talk a little bit about free speech. Um, and I know this will be very familiar to, to most of you, maybe less so to others, but I just wanted to kind of set you up and talk a little bit about um, uh, free speech protections. I think everybody knows we have the first amendment to the US Constitution, the Bill of Rights. And you'll see there, so Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech. Um, and so you have uh, that in the US Constitution. In the Vermont Constitution, 
in Article 3 in Chapter 1, you have something similar that protects speech. So that the people have a right to freedom of speech and of writing and publishing their sentiments concerning the transactions of government and therefore the freedom of the press ought not to be restrained. So I just wanted to mention that when we're talking about um, these provisions, they guarantee free and public expression of opinions without censorship, interference, or restraint by the government. We're talking about government action. So I just wanted to mention that because I know just with everything going on uh, in the world right now and Twitter and all kinds of other stuff and people are talking more about like freedom of speech, things like that. You know, these are protections from government interference with freedom of speech, okay? So the government can't restrict you. But constitutional rights, I think, as we know, they're not absolute. It's not like you have a right to free speech, which means you can say anything anytime you want, no matter the content, uh, content or the context. Um, uh, government does regularly uh, pass laws that in myriad ways um, make little infringements on these constitutional rights. And that, uh, and that happens all the time. And, um, and so the questions considered are, you know, what type of speech is it? Um, the degree of the government infringement on the speech and the government's reason for making that infringement on the speech, okay? So generally speech is protected under the First Amendment unless it falls into a narrow category of exceptions. And I think there's probably lots more exceptions than these, but I just listed some that don't get First Amendment protection. So things like obscenity, fighting words, uh, incitement, threats, and child sex abuse uh, materials are not afforded First Amendment protections. Um, so you think, well, then why do we even need to talk about the First Amendment? Because we're dealing with a, with a, uh, a bill that is talking specifically about child sexual abuse materials. Well, we need to be careful that when you are drafting these laws that you don't unintentionally draft them in a way that is so broad that you, that you sweep in constitutionally protected material, or that if you do sweep in any potential constitutionally protected material, that, um, that it's um, doing so, it's having as little impact as possible, and that there's a really, really good argument from the state about why you have to pass this law. What is the government's interest? So the character and the content of the speech determines what level of scrutiny the court's going to take, uh, is going to use to ascertain whether or not the government has enacted a law that impermissibly infringes on a person's free speech rights. So an example of that is like political speech is afforded greater protection than commercial speech, right? And so they would use a different standard to kind of analyze um, a, a challenge. And then the last thing that I just wanted to mention is this idea of um, the difference between a facial challenge versus an as applied challenge. Um, and a facial challenge means that someone is challenging the law and saying that as written, basically the law on its face at all times in all scenarios is unconstitutional and therefore it invalidates the law for everybody. And as applied challenge means that the law is, um, is unconstitutional on a certain set of facts. So as applied to a particular case or circumstances. And in that scenario, you can have a law and you could say, and the court can say, well, it, can't, it has all these constitutional readings and applications, but it can't be used in this particular way. And I bring that up because I know that the debate between the Attorney General's office and the Defender General's office as it was last year was a whether or not the language and by including simulated conduct, could you unintentionally sweep in um, you know, certain, certain movies or things like that that aren't 
intended to be a uh, child sexual abuse materials. It might be something that's, you know, showing on Netflix or something like that, that is trying to convey uh, something and uh, has artistic value or things like that. Um, and so they're going to probably talk about that and then we'll, we'll circle back around and have a bigger discussion about that. But I did want to say that just because it might implicate potentially something that might have some protections and is not considered to be child sexual abuse material, that doesn't mean that the whole law falls and that the whole law is out. Um, so uh, there are a number of states, I think the vast majority of states have some version of this law with regard to simulated conduct, um, as well as at the federal level. So you're not necessarily treading new ground here. Um, so we can look to those other states and, uh, and I think looking at, there is- Michelle, can, can you repeat that? Uh, I, I guess go back about 30 <laughs> seconds when you started talking about other states and challenges, I think you said. Yeah, I think there's 44 states that have something similar. So the vast majority of states are something. Um, and there is a case that I'm sure the witnesses will probably discuss, uh, the Ferber case out of New York that was um, that addressed addressed these issues. And so, um, so it, this is not a, this is not a new territory. I would just say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Martin, did you or? Did yeah, you? yeah, I had a, qu a quick question. So, so are we going to hear your opinion after the folks? Uh, the uh, sure, the or I can just cut to the chase and tell you I think it's fine. Sneak <laughs> <Okay. laughs> <Okay>. peek. <laughs> I mean, so all right. When you say I think it's fine. Mm -hmm. I assume that you mean on the facial challenge because you, who knows? Uh, yeah. yeah, I think I can certainly see how there could be an as applied challenge. Um, you know, by if we go back and we look at um, that language. So if there was a simulated, I mean, I don't know that the addition, I, I, I would have to hear maybe from the Defender General's office, um, you know, because I'm I'm learning all the time, just as like you guys are, you know, when we hear and we have experts come in that really practice in these areas and stuff. So, you know, maybe there could be a situation where there was like some kind of blockbuster movie that had a simulation, you know, that wouldn't wouldn't be something that you're necessarily targeting with this law. Um, and so, you know, maybe somebody could have an as applied challenge, but I think with the addition of the breast genitals or buttocks, and that means that you basically, the actor would have to be 15 years or younger um, and simulated in contact, conduct, and there would have to be some nudity involved. And so I think that the, the addition of that language there at the end really drops the, the chances that anything could potentially fall into that category that is stuff that you would that um, that you didn't intend. Um, but if they did challenge, I mean, first of all, you'd have to have, you know, a prosecutor decide to bring bring the the uh, the case, which I know that there was that I don't know what's come of it, but there was that prosecutor in Texas at the end of last year who brought one against like Netflix, I think, or or somebody for some. Uh, movie. Uh, I have to Google that, but I do remember when it came up thinking, oh, on point for this bill. Um, and I'd forgotten about it till then. Uh, but, uh, you know, you'd have to have a prosecutor decide they're going to charge it. And then the, and then whoever's charged can bring this up as a defense and say, you know, as applied to us, we clearly, you know, have, uh, we don't fall into the category of uh, child sexual abuse materials, or we shouldn't fall under that. And this is um, too broad. There's something called the overbreadth doctrine, which means that it, you have, you're sweeping in too much constitutionally protected material and the law isn't drawn um, narrow, narrowly enough to, uh, to really get at the prohibited conduct that doesn't have the protections. Um, so I, I'm comfortable from a constitutional legal standpoint with this language. Um, and uh, so, yeah. 
So, so just to follow, I mean, so the concern, if there is a concern, isn't just whether somebody would be prosecuted uh, or not, and whether the uh, uh, a prosecutor decides to bring a case. You think uh, like prior not, restraint not, kind of stuff? Yeah, prior, yeah, prior restraint, or, or even, yeah, suppressing speech. It's, that's, yeah, maybe it's prior restraint is the, is the concept I'm, I'm thinking about. So th isn't that a lens through which we should look at this as well? Sure. Yeah, I think so. You know, you can, you can think about that and whether or not that, you know, this would mean, you know, how, how I mean, I hadn't really, I mean, I, I thought about it a little bit, but it's like, the question is, is how much does it really, um, on someone's ability to communicate freely under this, right? So uh, I think you could still probably, you know, easily make your, uh, make the movie have a simulation, but maybe you don't have any nudity in it, or you have, you know, like there's, there's, there's certain guardrails there that you could still engage in communicating your message or art or whatever, but not necessarily specifically like under subdivision seven. So, but that is an excellent point. Thanks. Any other, I, I can't see everybody's hands. So if I'm, if somebody's hand is up and I'm missing, oh, Tom, I see yours, but also, anybody else, if I don't call on you, please, please jump in. Tom, go ahead. Oh, yep, thank you. Uh, so, Michelle, um, it's, it's been upheld. Has it been challenged in those 44 states? Yeah, there's you know? the Ferber case is the one that um, that they're going to, that I think the witnesses are going to kind of dig in more. I'm trying not to, like, uh, scoop David, because he wrote this yep. Memo. <laughs> no, I, I appreciate that. And um, and he, I think, will discuss some of the case law and the the cases that have applicability. And then I'm happy to circle back back around. Okay, maybe maybe I'll save some for him. But but can we go back to your constitutional page? Sure. And uh, so can you just, I guess, in more lay terms, uh. uh Describe or tell us what facial challenges versus as applied again. Uh, I know it's written there, sure. pretty pretty simple, but I guess I guess I need it just a little simpler. <laughs> sure. So a facial challenge is like somebody saying, you know, I'm just going to look at this. I'm going to look at this law right here, and just looking at it here, there's no. It, it's it's just straight up facially unconstitutional. Like there's not any uh, constitutional applications here. However, you would use this. It's so sweeping and infringes so dramatically on constant on free speech rights that, as a whole, it is unconstitutional and cannot be upheld. And then the as applied would be, I think, is what we're talking about here in this particular case, which is like, so you, you read it and, you know, it's the, the issue is if you look at this language and you say, well, are there some situations? The, uh, clearly there are lots of situations where this would apply and prohibiting it would be constitutional, right? So in cases of child sexual abuse material, that's what the goal is, right? And so as applied to child sexual abuse materials, we know there's no protection there and it's, and it's constitutional to do this. However, let's say you had somebody like the Texas prosecutor, you know, and you had somebody here in Vermont that wanted to do that and they look at this language and they say, well, you know, that movie, you know, you can see just a little bit of the breast and, and the, 15 year olds are making out and you know that kind of stuff and say and and they say well I think it violates this and the person could chat you know so if the if um the person was prosecuted they could bring up and say well I think as applied to me in this particular instance and case it's unconstitutional it may be constitutional as applied to you know, the, the stuff they were taking off of Pornhub and things like that and things that everybody clearly agrees 
is, is child sexual abuse materials, but it's not constitutional as applied to me in my artsy movie that I made on a $5 million budget and shows on Netflix and Amazon Prime. So it's, a, it's, it's, a po it's, a po it's the difference between the whole universe and the whole law is out versus one way in which the, the, the law is utilized and applied. Okay, great, thank you. And, and the, thing that, the thing that's important there is because when you have as applied challenge, it doesn't mean that the whole law has to go down. If it's a facial challenge, the whole law goes down because it, it, there's no, you can't, don't have any valid constitutional um, uses for that statute. If it's an as applied, you know, sometimes if it's a certain provision, they'll strike down a certain provision or they'll just say, you know, this law can't be used to go after the, that type of conduct because it doesn't fit. Because they have constitutional rights that are not afforded if it's child sexual abuse material. Okay, and, and one more um, that, that I think I have for you. So uh, can you go back to the constitutional page again and up at the top of the page where you had article one and, and I don't, or uh, uh, first yeah. amendment and I don't remember what article, article 13. Um, so I, I know with some amendments and some uh, articles in the Vermont Constitution, they, they say basically the same thing, but, but I, uh, uh, one, uh, I know one in Vermont that uh, the language in, in, the, in an article compared to, well, it's article 16 compared to the, the second amendment. The way that I understand it is it's, uh, it's a lot stronger wording in Vermont as far as freedoms go. And, and I didn't know with, with the language uh, between these two, if there was any, uh, any uh, big differences in the, in the way that it's worded. Right, that's a, that's a great question, um, Tom. And right, there are differences between, in, between compared the constitutions on certain issues. Another example is with regard to search and seizure. And Vermont, the Vermont Constitution has been interpreted to be more protective um, of people's rights around around issues of search and seizure than the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. So there are differences. Yeah. I, I I had thought about this, and it's something that I wanted to look up and look at the case law. My recollection from you know I don't work on these First Amendment issues that often, but was that there's not I, that there's not any large distinction between the two but I can follow I can take a look at that and the witnesses may have something have be able to chime in on that as well okay great thank you mm -hmm. anybody else okay all right well that's it for me right now but I'm still here so Great. To hearing from the witnesses. Great. Thank you. I appreciate that, Michelle. So I'm looking at our time and I said that we'd be taking a break after, um, after an hour, uh, about five minutes away from that. So I just want to ask Matt if, if you wanted to uh, come back and testify more at this point or, or if you're all set and give you the opportunity to, to weigh in now if you, if you did have more to add. I think uh, most of the rest of it is a uh, legal uh, you know, discussion. However, I would like to say uh, on the practicality uh, of the app, you know, applying this in the practical world, um, this is what I do every day. And the movie that they were talking about, the Netflix movie, was actually a movie called Cuties. I don't know if you've heard of it. Um, and as this law is written, uh, we would not be able to indict Netflix as um, Texas did. And uh, doubt they'll be successful in their prosecution there even. But uh, as this law is written, the movie Cuties, which I, I viewed as, uh, because we've got more complaints on it. Um, and, you know, it would not meet the definition uh, that, that's defined here. So it would still be uh, completely legal to possess Cuties in Vermont after this was passed. As the case. Um, and the same is true of all the other, um, you know, no, the ones that I know of that people bring up, like taxi driver and um, they still wouldn't be in violation of this statute as it's been rewritten. For this year. Thank you. Thank you. The, the only other thing I would say is, you know, th these are, um, you know, this is the best solution we can come up with for the, the real problem of 
people possessing this this material. Uh, so it's, it's definitely a needed change to occur. Uh, thanks for your time. Thank you. Thank you very much. I see Kate's hand. Yeah, thanks. Um, just Matthew, before you go, I had a quick question um, related to the reading of the bill, and I don't have the language right in front of me. I can't navigate Zoom well enough right now to hold two screens at once, but um, I was just curious, you know, part of what you're talking about are these loopholes that make your job harder and just noticing that section of the bill that was added in terms of explicitly stating that you have to be able to see parts of the body in order for this to be um, a particular kind of offense. And I'm just curious in your world, if that gives you any concern or pause if you feel like you would encounter cases where that that specific section would would get in the way of you being able to move forward, no, I believe I believe as written, uh, this would be this would be fine for us. Um, you know, there's always going to be those cases that are on the edge uh, that you that you can't think of right now that pop up, and that's just you know life. But they're going to be so few and far between. Th these are things that I see a lot um, of that that are loopholes right now. And that's what we're trying to cover. Um, you know, there'll always be some on the fringe area that, you know, makes us concerned, but we wouldn't be able to follow up on. Um, and I don't think it's possible to write in a scenario for everything, but this, this as written would be fantastic. And, and for, uh, you know, the yeah, iPad. Thank you. Thank you. Seeing any other hands. Okay. So, uh, let's take a break for about um, 15 minutes and then we'll come back for another 45 minutes and we'll start with the Attorney General's office. And um, we may not get through all the witnesses uh, today, but this is also on our agenda for tomorrow morning after the floor. And I imagine into next week or, or later as well. So, okay, so let's take a, a break, please. So welcome back and we're gonna uh, continue our witness testimony and we will now hear from the Attorney General's office. David, welcome. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thanks to the, to the committee for taking up this bill. Uh, as you heard a few minutes ago, it is of significant interest to our ICAC task force, and we certainly appreciate you taking the time to work through this. It does have some challenging constitutional discussions, uh, and this committee did not, I don't believe, have the benefit of a sort of preview of those from last summer, which we had in the other Judiciary Committee, but um, I'm hopeful that uh, all the parties in this are well prepared and can give you a clear overview of what's going on. Um, and for the record, I don't think I identified myself, David Chair, with the Attorney General's Office. Uh, so I did write up a memo for the uh, Joint Justice Oversight Committee uh, at the request of the legislature last year. And I distributed that to, I just believe it's up on the Judiciary Committee's website and hopefully you have had a chance to, uh, at least uh, you may not have had a chance to review it in full, but at least have it in front of you. Um, and my plan for today is to do a brief overview of that because it gives you the broad outline of the uh, constitutionality issues. And I wanna thank Michelle for doing a great job, uh, Attorney Childs for doing a great job of the conceptual overview around the constitutional issues. I think that was a very helpful uh, beginning to this issue. So the change that we're asking for, uh, I wanna say up front, this is a, this is not legal adventurism. We are not going out on a limb here. There are uh, around 44 states and the federal government and, and um, the District of Columbia, all of which have the provision that we're requesting regarding simulated conduct. And the, as you'll see, in a, uh, as I go through the series of cases, the US Supreme Court has in fact held that the type of change we're asking for is uh, not protected by the First Amendment and therefore it is uh, allowable to criminalize it. Um, and the Defender General's office uh, and our office had a long back and forth on this last year. And, I'm, and I know that uh, Deputy Defender General Paul will be giving his side of it. And I may say a few comments that uh, anticipate his arguments, but I'm sure that uh, he will uh, defend himself and his position very adequately after I go. And I hope not to misrepresent anything. 
uh, that he would that he would say. Um, I will start with an overview of, I'm going to skip through the introductory part of my memo and sort of start because that's just the language that we're requesting and Michelle, uh, Attorney Childs already discussed a lot of that with you. I'm going to just go through the precedent that uh, is relevant to this particular case. And I should say we're actually pretty lucky because we have US Supreme Court cases that are precisely on point. Oftentimes in the law, we have to reason by analogy. We have to look at cases that are similar to the situation we're talking about uh, and then make an assessment about whether the court will apply similar situations or similar facts or similar concepts to the case that we're dealing with. Uh, here, in fact, we have a series of cases um, that increasingly precisely defines the uh, legality and constitutionality of the provisions we're looking at. Um, I will summarize the rule by basically it says that a depiction of sexual conduct that was produced using an actual child. In David, before you, are, are you reading from your memo? And if I, you are, where is it? I am at the moment reading from my memo. It is on, uh, I believe, page four under subsection A, the legal rule summarized. Great, thank you. And I'm going to sort of go, I'm mostly not going to read from the memo. I'm just going to try to summarize in a way that uh, to the best of my ability is. Okay. But there will be moments when I read from it. And that's where I am uh, right now. It's under the legal rule summarized subsection A. Um, the basic rule, if you were to summarize the case law, sort of scrunch it together and say, this is what it stands for. Uh, is that a depiction of sexual conduct that was produced using an actual child involved in the conduct whether that conduct was simulated or actual is not protected speech and it may be criminalized. Uh, however, and this is an important distinction here, depictions of child sexual abuse that were not produced using an actual child. So that means virtual depictions, drawings, computer generated uh, images, things like that. Those are protected speech. And I wanna be clear that we are not proposing here to outlaw that because that would in fact be unconstitutional. Uh, under Supreme Court precedent. Um, what we are proposing to do is say that depictions that were created uh, using an actual child, meaning a human being who is under the age of 16, uh, is those simulations are, we're saying that those are criminalized and, um, and we believe that that's squarely within the constitutional precedence. Uh, and as Attorney Childs alluded to, there are there's a, a key case here that sort of is the foundation for a lot of our thinking about child sexual abuse materials, or I will sometimes use the uh, term child pornography, which we no longer use generally, but because the case law still uses it, it will be easier for me to just reference that. Uh, and I think will be clear for you to follow if I, if I reference that phrase. Um, the Ferber, New York versus Ferber case, which is really the sort of foundational case around uh, child sexual abuse materials or child pornography is something I'm going to cover now. And there's also two subsequent cases that are highly relevant to this and that I want to cover and um, give a little overview about the meaning and how together these cases create the rule that I just described. Um, so the Ferber case was the case that basically defined, um, or I should say, uh, held that child sexual abuse materials, child pornography are not protected by uh, the First Amendment and in fact have lower protections than so-called obscene material, which is something that is frankly rarely litigated anymore. Um, but earlier Supreme Court cases had said that, uh, you know, obscenity is not protected, but they set a pretty high standard or, or set a standard that you had to reach before materials were considered to be obscene. And Ferber basically says, if, if you have uh, materials that were produced uh, using a child to depict sexual conduct, in other words, child pornography, that is not protected uh, by the First Amendment. And it, and it doesn't have to reach the sort of obscenity definition that had earlier been created by the uh, US Supreme Court. And the reason they said that was there's this grave harm that we're trying to prevent. And that grave harm is the 
sort of psychological and physical damage that uh, is done to a child in the production of these materials. Um, and Ferber made a couple of, and, and I should say, we modeled our proposal in this law uh, after New York's law, which does, which very similarly to our, ours, um, our proposal anyway, uh, outlawed um, actual or simulated sexual intercourse, and it noted that the uh, simulation, in their definition of simulation, it had to uh, involve nudity of the type that we have included in, as defined the same way that we defined it in this proposal. Um, and that as long as it, and again, there was this sort of implication that it, it, it does require an actual child to be involved. Uh, and Ferber actually considers that issue. They, they, it's not the heart of their, um, well, let me say two things. One, Ferber does very clearly, uh, understand, the court understands that it is allowing a prohibition on simulated sexual conduct, it explicitly cites the New York statute several times in its opinion and notes that it includes simulated sexual conduct. And it says, we find that this to be a constitutionally permissible prohibition, that this is not protected by the First Amendment. Um, and Ferber even contemplates the notion that uh, Simula uh, simulations that do not involve an actual child might be permissible because we are outside the sort of uh, policy realm that they're trying to carve out. We're trying to say, look, these things cause grave damage. We're not going to allow uh, the production of these materials because they're so psychologically damaging to children. But uh, simulations that do not involve an actual child uh, could be could potentially be permissible. And Ferber doesn't go into that in great detail, but it's clear that the court has already um, started thinking about that distinction and they are very aware of the fact that they are in fact outlawing simulated material in addition to actual uh, sexual conduct or sexual intercourse. And the court says, and I, this is, I'm gonna refer back to some of the concepts Attorney Childs spoke about earlier. Um, the court basically says, look, this is permissible because of the policy reasons we talked about needing to protect children, and it is not overbroad. In other words, it does not sweep in too much conduct that uh, is protected by the First Amendment. Um, it, it sort of acknowledges in the opinion that it is, as Attorney Childs acknowledged here, it is possible that there could be a, a case brought, uh, or there could be a challenge brought in a particular circumstance that there's an as applied challenge to a particular set of facts, but it says that uh, because the broad sweep of what's being outlawed here is a permissible sweep, uh, uh, this is not overbroad and is uh, and does not violate the First Amendment. So then we get a and that's that's a summary of Ferber. Then we move on to Ashcroft, which is another Ashcroft, excuse me, Ashcroft versus the Free Speech Coalition which is another key case in the genesis of the law here. And Ashcroft makes an important distinction, which says that uh, if there are depictions of child sexual abuse that were not produced using an actual child, in other words, things like drawings, things like uh, computer animations, uh, computer simulations, things like that, uh, those, are, those are protected by the First Amendment and uh, they cannot be uh, they do not have the same sort of carve out that Ferber created for child pornography, for child sexual abuse materials. And the reason for that, Ashcroft explains, is because unlike in Ferber, we are not talking about materials uh, that required for their production the harm of children. Um, that was a convoluted sentence I just said, but let me try to state that a little more plainly. Um, the, uh, the materials we're talking about, when you're talking about a simulation, you're talking about a drawing, no child was necessary to create that. And so the uh, First Amendment, or I should say the policy concern that underlay Ferber is not present because there is not a child being harmed. Um, so Ashcroft says, look, if there's no child being harmed, then uh, that does get the protection of the First Amendment and, um, and you cannot outlaw that. We were very aware of that in designing our proposal for you today. And as Attorney Childs explained, um, 
the proposal that we have does not permit the, uh, uh, I should say, does not criminalize uh, materials that are not produced using an actual child. And, and uh, Michelle explained that when you look at our current statutory scheme, the only um, instances in which it's applicable, even now, before our proposed amendment, but even now, the only instances in which it's per, uh, applicable are ones where there is an actual child involved. So we are outside of, we are not invading Ashcroft's territory. We're outside of that. We're saying um, we are not trying to outlaw simulations that do not involve an actual child. Um, my understanding of part of the Defender General's argument when we talked about this before is that Ashcroft outlaws any simulation. Uh, and I think that that is not the case. And I will stop, uh, Marshall shaking his head, Deputy Defender Paul shaking his head, I will stop characterizing his argument and let him make it himself. Um, but I will say that we think that there is a, that's a key distinction. And it's not one that, the, the, I should say the key distinction is the distinction between simulations that uh, an actual, where an actual child is involved in the production, simulations where there is not an actual child involved in the production. And uh, you may outlaw the first, you may not outlaw the second. Um, and we are not outlawing the second, which is instances where there's a simulation, but no, uh, no actual child is involved uh, in, in its production. Uh, the final, and, and I should say again, sort of without uh, getting into it in detail, Ashcroft does acknowledge the difference uh, between uh, simulations involving a child and simulations that don't. The final case I'll mention is one that- Hey, David. It I just want to I just want to check in with committee members to make sure everybody is following see if anybody else needs David to repeat anything or yeah, you're all good okay all right thank you David go ahead uh, thank you chair grab this stuff is it can be confusing and uh, and I apologize for that I'll do the best I can to keep it simple and I should say I'm getting to the close of my summary here uh, which is U.S. v. Williams, which uh, addresses this issue uh, as, as a piece of its case. It's not primarily focused on this issue, but it does make clear, it sort of closes the loop on this point that I've been driving towards, which is that there is a distinction. It's just that simulated sexual intercourse that uh, does not involve, I should say the depiction, let me be clear, we're talking about depictions here, uh, the depiction of simulated sexual intercourse that does not involve an actual child um, is constitutionally protected, uh, but simulations that do not involve, uh, or, sorry, simulations that uh, do not involve, let me start that whole let me wind that back and start that whole sentence again because I'm afraid I started to say it backwards and I don't want to confuse the issue. Um, William sort of summarizes the point that I've been driving towards, which is that a visual depiction that involves uh, an actual child, uh, that is permissible to outlaw, that is outside of the First Amendment. Uh, and Ashcroft, and I'm uh, sorry, US v. Williams sort of says, uh, look, we're clarifying that that is the case. Um, you can uh, outlaw simulated depictions of simulated sexual intercourse as long as the production of them involves actual children. And again, that's what we're doing here. Simulated cases that do not involve, uh, simulated depictions that do not involve an actual child are, again, protected by the First Amendment, and that is not what we're doing here. And so that's an overview. And again, uh, this stuff is not, it's not simple. This is a, a big constitutional um, uh, issue with some complex concepts. That being said, I don't think we're close to the line here. I think that this is this is very plainly uh, constitutional. Uh, federal law uh, it does exactly what we are proposing to do. The U.S. Supreme Court had the opportunity. You know, in some of these cases, they probably could have uh, addressed that aspect of the federal law and and decided that it was unconstitutional. They did not. Um, and especially, I should say, the Ashcroft case, which could have presented that question uh, to the court, or the court could have chosen to consider that. They did not. And, and, and um, they did not rule that uh, simulations involving actual children 
are protected by the First Amendment. They declined to do that. And I think that we are very safely within uh, that which is permissible under the Constitution. And, the, and again, the other thing I'll say is we are fortunate here. Oftentimes, I, I find this a useful way to think about this particular line of cases and the statute we're trying to um, pass, trying to pass into law here, which is that Sometimes we do have to reason by analogy as lawyers and as legislators thinking about the law. Uh, we don't have to do that here. And we have a line of cases that is exactly about uh, the law that we are trying to uh, pass. And I think that's very helpful and to me very clarifying in how we think about it. So that was my summary. I will wrap it up. I'm happy to take questions uh, and um, fire away. I do see I see Barbara and then Tom. Thank you, David. That that was interesting. I've got to say, for those of us in the room that um, had young children years ago, every time we heard about Ferber, I kept thinking about the baby sleeping method, which is called Ferberizing. So I had to stop making that association. But I'm curious, and maybe this is like getting too kind of in the weeds, I'm wondering because I could picture not not having a real child, but modeling a real child to make the plastic dummy or the anime, etc., or or um, uh, you know putting somebody a kid's face on it, and again. If the kid doesn't see the movie, which they obviously shouldn't be, it wouldn't necessarily be harm, but um, the modeling part they may be. And again, maybe that's just like too weird and nuanced and we shouldn't worry about that. But it, I just found myself going to that sort of middle spot that could get murky. Yeah, a couple of thoughts on that. One is that, um... Fair question, and frankly, uh, arguments along those lines were in the government's briefing, if I'm remembering correctly, in the government's briefing in uh, one of the cases that I'm thinking of, I think it was Ashcroft. Uh, and basically Ashcroft said, no, look, the policy issue that we are concerned about is the harm that results to children in the production of these materials. And so other types of harm, like the ones that you are talking about, are outside of that policy consideration. And for that reason, um, they were not willing to sort of extend what could be outlawed to include um, simulations that don't involve, the production of which did not involve actual children. So uh, I think you raise a, a, a fair question, a fair point of concern, but it's one that the US Supreme Court said, no, this lies outside of our policy concern here. We are gonna keep a, a, a narrow view of what can be outside of First Amendment protection and we're not, um, the, the only policy consideration we're thinking about is, is what happens in the production of these materials. And probably there's another law that would protect somebody's face from being used unless they're a famous person, but we don't need that here. That's right. And, you know, I will also say sort of to help conceptualize what we're thinking about here from the other side, from the sort of um, uh, side of why things can be useful. You know, there are things that we, there are uses that we don't want to outlaw. We don't want to outlaw medical textbooks, for example, that uh, depict something. Those are, I think, would be broadly agreed uh, to be perfectly permissible places where you could make depictions. Um, and, and there needs to be room to do that, to educate doctors and find cures. Uh, and we can do that by doing things like drawings and things like that. So there, so uh, Ashcroft was thinking about, the Ashcroft case was thinking about those other uh, reasonable uses of um, simulated depictions where it's not sort of for a prurient sexual interest, but for a genuine potentially educational interest uh, it, to, uh, illustrate the example I was just mentioning. Thank you. Tom. Yep. Thank you. Thank you, David. Um, just some clarification, I guess, for me. Uh, Ferber, uh, did you say that uh, in, in, the, in the Ferber decision that it was determined that some simulated could be permissible? 
but was Ferber. it narrower? Was it was the I guess it was the Ferber uh, decision narrower than the Ashcroft decision? I would I would say the Ashcroft decision narrows the Ferber decision, or at least makes explicit um, makes very explicit that there's a, a, a certain simulations that cannot that that do receive First Amendment protection. Um, Okay, I think I said it backwards. <laughs> yeah, it's, it gets very confusing very quickly. And as you saw from my presentation, I, I stumble on it too sometimes. Um, that being said, Ferber does uh, sort of contemplate the idea that some simulations uh, would be permissible. And they even state that, you know, they give an example where they're like, you know, if there's some sort of um, artistic interest involved or something like that, where the sort of idea of a, a minor being involved in, in sexual conduct is something that needs to be, that is reasonable to be portrayed or uh, there's some sort of other like, genuine societal value to that. Um, Ferber says you could use a person over the statutory age who uh, may appear to be under the statutory age. And Ferber says that that could be permissible. Um, and frankly, Ashcroft clarifies that that would in fact be permissible. Okay. Um, so Ferber does acknowledge this difference between the uh, simulation involving an actual child and simulations that don't involve an actual child. Okay, even though I, I said it wrong, I think I did understand it. Um, and the, uh, the part with the uh, breast genitals and buttocks, you said New York has that in their, in their it does, law? It does, yes. And, and uh, I'm going to assume other the other 43 jurisdictions might not, or some might not, or some do, or? You assume correctly, not all the other jurisdictions have that limitation on it. Uh, we thought it was a reasonable limitation. Uh, we thought we did it to be very safe constitutionally, knowing that uh, the US Supreme Court had ruled on this exact statutory scheme in the New York v. Ferber case. Um, and we also, uh, you know, it's sort of responsive to some of the Defender General's arguments from uh, or earlier from last year regarding practical examples where uh, there might be uh, underage people being portrayed, uh, but there was no nudity in those. And arguably, the sort of proposal we came out with last year, which did not have that limitation, it could have encompassed some of those um, depictions, which were, you know, sort of depictions that I think would broadly be considered of artistic value, of artistic merit. And we wanted to make sure we weren't sweeping those in. And so we chose to um, take the New York statute for that reason as well. Okay, um, I, I don't know how to say this one exactly. Um, so, so I guess, I, I guess in Vermont law now and, and with this, uh, the only way I can think to put it is where does cuties fall into this? So, cuties would not, I, I've also watched cuties because it became a uh, subject of, of some discussion and controversy in this exact realm. Um, and this statute simply wouldn't apply to cuties. As uh, Commander Raymond mentioned earlier, I think quite correctly, uh, this nudity requirement um, would mean that nudity, uh, cuties, sorry, simply couldn't be uh, brought, it simply couldn't be prosecuted because there is not the nudity of the kind that is defined in this statute. It, so it, it could not be prosecuted under this law. All right. Okay. All right. Be interested to hear Marshall, I guess. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank you. Not seeing any other hands. Okay, great. David, are you all, are you all set? I'm all set. Thank you very much. Well, thank you. Okay, great. So, Marshall, we have 15 minutes left. So, um, if you don't finish, or um, yeah, certainly we're going to come back to this. Um, and um, some of us have a, have a meeting afterwards, so that's why we have a, a hard stop. But um, but welcome. Thank you. Um, so, just to begin, because I don't think I've had a chance to introduce myself to the new committee, I am Marshall Paul. I'm the Deputy Defender General and the chief juvenile defender. So um, I think that my boss, Matt Valerio, has been in and introduced himself to you. Uh, I am, I don't wanna say I'm, but Matt's my boss, let's put it that way. So me and Matt work together and um, sometimes you'll see me, sometimes you'll see Matt. 
So on this issue, um, I think there's been, you know, this law has come a long way from where it was when it was introduced uh, essentially a year ago. A year ago, the law that was introduced was entirely unconstitutional. Um, this gets much closer, but it's not there. And some of what David has been saying gives me a little pause because he's saying, you know, this is, this is easy because we, we don't need to operate um, essentially by kind of uh, implication and analogy. And, and then he goes on to apply analogy um, because what, what, the, what the proposal here does not do is it does not track exactly with the language that the US Supreme Court has said is okay. And I would have no problem if what we were in here looking at was the language that, for example, the US Supreme Court approved of in, in Williams. But that's not what we have here. And I, so I think that where we're at with this bill is that there's two primary problems. And I don't want to go all the way back and get into Ferber, because I certainly disagree with David, David's interpretation of Ferber. I mean, if you look at Ferber, nobody challenged simulated child pornography in Ferber. It's not even mentioned in the briefing to the extent that the court talks about it. They talk about it in dicta, um, which dicta meaning it's not part of the holding of the case. It didn't make any actual law around simulated child pornography. And then you get to Ashcroft v. Free Speech Coalition, um, where the US Supreme Court said exactly what David said, which is, well, not quite exactly what David said. What they said in Ashcroft, they did not say, you are allowed wholesale to criminalize um, the possession of um, simulated child pornography as long as it doesn't involve, uh, or as long as it, see, I got mixed up the same way David did. In Ashcroft, what the, the Supreme Court said, um, they, what they didn't say is they didn't say you are allowed to criminalize the uh, possession of simulated child pornography as long as it involves an actual child. What they said was the opposite. They said you're not allowed to criminalize uh, the possession of child pornography if it involves, if it does not involve a actual child. And there's a difference there. It's one thing for them to say it in the negative. That doesn't necessarily imply that the positive is true, and certainly not in some sort of wholesale sense. So then you get to the case that actually, I think, really does dic sort of draw the lines for this statute, and that's Williams. And Williams goes through and says, yes, you can, in fact, criminalize the possession of child pornography that involves... Um, that's simulated as long as it involves an actual child, if it meets the following criteria. And then they go through and they lay out several criteria and they even number the paragraphs, first, second, third, fourth. Now where David says that um, in Williams that uh, simulated child pornography was not at the core or at the heart of the decision, I disagree. It absolutely was. The defendant in Williams raised two challenges to a federal statute, the Federal Protect Act. Um, and the, the, the challenges they raised were one, that it used a bad definition of, because um, that was a statute that prohibited um, what they called the pandering, which essentially was the offering up or the, you know, the, the offering to distribute of child pornography, including simulated child pornography. And, um, the way that the, the the way that the way that the defendant in that case challenged it was to challenge it on two particular grounds. One was that the definition of pandering was no good, and the other was that it's that it still ran afoul of Ashcroft, that it still criminalized the possession of simulated child pornography that was actually protected. Um, so it really, to me, that simulation issue was absolutely at the heart of the Williams decision. It was one of the two grounds that defendant Williams challenged the statute on. Um, and it's one of the, you know, they, and the Supreme Court ruled on both of those grounds. So when they were talking, when US Supreme Court was talking about why the statute in Williams, the federal statute was permissible, why it was okay, why it did, was not unconstitutional under the first amendment, 
they ran through a number of factors, and there's two that I think remain relevant to our discussion of this statute. And the first is um, one that's been touched on, which is whether or not this statute actually explicitly says that an actual child must be involved. And, you know, when Attorney Childs was uh, walking through the statute and talking about uh, how this statute requires the, the involvement of an actual child rather than some simulation, she acknowledged that it was a little bit confusing, that you essentially had to go from the definition statute to the, uh, you know, to the statute that's actually prohibiting the, to the actual offense statute, and then back to the definition statute to sort of see the thread of how this, this proposed statute actually says that an actual child must be involved. That's a pretty complicated path, and at no point in that path does it actually say the words actual child. Whereas what the U.S. Supreme Court has affirmed and said is okay is a statute that, that uses the words visual depiction of an actual child. So I don't understand why we wouldn't use the language that the Supreme Court has already approved of and instead say what we're going to do is something that we all acknowledge is kind of convoluted and never, never in any place, whether in the definition statutes or in the actual prohibition statutes, never uses the language actual child when we have a case from the U.S. Supreme Court that says if you use the words visual depiction of an actual child, you're okay. Um, so that's my first point, is that we can get around that whole issue, that, that A, I disagree that, that this statute is crystal clear, that only actual children are subject to the prohibition. Um, I think that it is less clear than that, but I think that even if it, you know, leaving that debate over how clear it actually is aside, why would we not just simply adopt the language that the Supreme Court has already approved of when it says exactly what we want it to say? So then the second issue, and I think this one's a little bit thornier, um, has to do with the intent. So in Williams, the U.S. Supreme Court said that it was okay to prohibit the um, possession of simulated child pornography that involved an actual child. And one of the key features of that statute that, they, that the Supreme Court pointed to and said made it okay to prohibit that was that there was both a subjective and an objective element of intent. Um, and what that really means is that not only was the simulated depiction, um, did the person who possessed it uh, or the person who was trying to distribute it in that case uh, actually believe that what they were distributing was that, the, that they were putting it out there with the intention that people believe it was actual child pornography. And then that the people who receive that subjectively believe that they are receiving child pornography. And I think that if we put in, so what we have in our statute instead it is, um, a piece, is we have a piece which says, hold on, I'm just trying to make sure I say exactly what the statute says. We have a piece that says, with knowledge of the character and content. But that doesn't go as far as what the U.S. Supreme Court approved of in uh, Williams. What they approved of there, and I'll read the language specifically from Williams, was that the, um, that the depiction was intended to cause another to believe, that's the end of the quote, that it was actual child pornography. I think if we put those two pieces in, and that would just make it so that what we're doing is not sort of saying, well, we have a statute that's kind of like the federal statute that was affirmed in Williams, but to actually use the same language that the US Supreme Court approved of in Williams, that would that would eliminate our constitutional concerns. But I wanna, since I have, it looks like six more minutes, I want to just touch on why this is so important because I think that that has also been left, left a little unclear. Um, in the conversations today, the distinction between an as-applied challenge and a facial challenge was brought up. And the definition of facial challenge that was used, I, I don't think is really an accurate reflection of what a facial challenge is. The, it, it's, 
the way it was said today was that a facial challenge is when the statute has no constitutional application at all. But that's not, that's not accurate. What it is is, and this is a little weird because, um, you know, it, for almost all of uh, the laws that we look at, we have these concepts like doctrines of severability and presumptions of constitutionality, which mean that if there's a statute and some piece of it is unconstitutional, then only that piece is invalid. Or if there's a statute and it could be read to be constitutional or it could be read to be unconstitutional, it's the constitutional reading that prevails. But it's different when it comes to the First Amendment. The US Supreme Court has treated the First Amendment entirely differently. And primarily, that revolves around two concepts, which are the doctrine of, of overbreadth, which leads to then a facial challenge. And so what a, what a facial challenge really is in the context of the First Amendment is it's when the defendant comes in and says, you don't need to look at anything about what I did or did not do. This statute covers speech that is constitutionally protected. And because it does, it can't apply to anyone, even to people who are engaging in speech that is not constitutionally protected. So to give you an example, um, when I do, I've done facial challenges to statutes on First Amendment grounds only a couple of times. But you know, when I do it, here would be an example. I'll, I'll, I'll use the child porn statute just because we're, that's what we're looking at. And I use the term child pornography not because I think it's the most appropriate term. I actually really like the change in language to uh, child sexual abuse materials. But because I'm talking about case law here, I'm using the term child pornography because that's what the case law uses. And it has a specific definition in constitutional law. And I don't want to lose that. So I'm going to use the term child pornography. But so if I had a child pornography statute that said, for example, what the proposal from last year said, which was essentially any simulation of sexual conduct involving a child under the age of 16 is unlawful without getting into, you know, artistic merit or anything like that, then I would bring a facial challenge. Even if, so let's say I had a defendant who was charged with possessing actual child pornography, the stuff that we are, you know, that you would imagine when you talk about child pornography, images of actual children being actually sexually abused, I could still challenge their conviction by saying, you know, not going in and saying my clients, you know, the, these images that my client had are constitutionally protected images, but by saying, look, this statute is written so broadly that it could cover material that is constitutionally protected. And because of that, it can't apply to anyone. Um, that's what a facial challenge is. And there's a real risk of that in this situation because if this statute is written so that it doesn't comply with the strict uh, guidelines or the strict requirements that the US Supreme Court has put into place, then it could invalidate the entire statute. And there would be a different effect here than it would in other states. There's been a lot of talk about how there's 44 states with simulated child pornography laws. That's true. But in most of those states, in pretty much all the ones I could find, it's a separate law. So if they wrote it too broadly, it would invalidate that statute and that statute alone. What this proposal does is it incorporates simulated child pornography into our general child pornography statute, which means that if this piece of it gets written too broadly, it could invalidate the entire statute, um, not just relating to simulated child pornography, not just related to, you know, certain, but the entirety of it, even the stuff that is exactly what you would traditionally imagine when you're thinking about child pornography and its prohibition. That's why what our office, our office's position is that if this is a statute that the legislature feels is necessary. The statute should mirror the language that the U.S. Supreme Court has approved of in Williams, and we shouldn't be out there on our own trying to sort of make up language that fits better into our existing statute, but departs from the language of Williams. So I know that left me with only one minute for questions. Um, 
I promise I did not do that on purpose. I actually like the question. So if anybody yeah, yeah. has a super short question, I'll take it, but otherwise. Yeah, no, no, thank you. And actually, um, Mike is having some technical difficulties, so he's not here and he's who we have a meeting with. So I guess maybe we have a little bit more time, but Marshall, I wanna make sure. So in terms of um, actual, um, your, um, your suggestion to put actual, uh, where would you, where would you want that? That's a good question. I haven't looked at ex exactly. Yeah, you, can, yeah you, can, you can get back back to me, but I'd be interested in, um, in that. Um, and also um, when, we, when we hear from you next time, it'd be, um, I'd like to um, hear more about intentional because you said something, but I, didn't, I couldn't follow where we would insert that. So you could get back to us or, or, or Michelle or something. Um, Okay, I see. Oh, Michelle, I'm sorry, did you have a question? I was just gonna say, I'm gonna take a look at it, but I think what you could do uh, is it's kind of, you guys oftentimes put things in there as like belts and suspenders for absolute clarity. I'm still of the position that it's, it's not necessary, but it's probably fine to add in the word actual into the definition of child under 2821. Um, that definition of child is the same one used in multiple places throughout the throughout the titles um, and you know there's never any other specification that it's a real actual child but maybe to include that would be nonsensical in those other contexts so I think it's probably fine if you choose to add it to the 2821 definition there but because you use child so often throughout I think you'd want to be careful about just adding it in certain places in the individual sections. Okay, all right, thank you. Uh, Martin. Yeah, that, that was gonna be one of my questions of whether it could just be in subsection uh, seven, but you're saying that that wouldn't work, uh, Michelle? Just in the simulation component and you're, uh, you're muted. You're muted, you're muted. <laughs> let me let me it's take a look at that session. it's early in the session you know it, only 30 more times before you start remembering well, i'm trying to be really careful about muting myself so you guys don't hear my dogs bark every time you know the mailman shows up and things like that so um uh let me take a look at it i think in an earlier draft when i was working on this one i thought about putting it into subdivision seven um and you know maybe we just put it there instead of into the definition section but i'll i'll take a look at it and play with it and... so my my quick question actually was going to be whether marshall could come back uh because i i would i think we need to dig into this more as well as uh david share uh, I, I'm really curious about the severability issue that that was a little bit of a surprise to me that this whole thing would be thrown out if we found that subsection seven so I'd like to understand that a little bit further. And I'd also like to understand where or how an intent uh, could be put into this or whether it's really necessary. Those are my big questions that, you know, probably not enough time to dig into it that deeply right now but yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, I was wondering about the severability as, as well. And we do have this on the agenda for tomorrow after the floor. And um, and I don't I don't see any witnesses here, but hopefully, um, I know Marshall, if or any other witnesses, if they're available, but if, if not, at the very least, we can we can work with Michelle and certainly get back to this um, next week. This is not something that we want to do too quickly. Appreciate that. Ken. Will, will Judge Grierson be involved in that, any of this testimony? I, you know, again, Judge Grierson usually speaks to us about the impact on the court um, a change in law would have. So, you know, would by changing this law, are we, you know, sometimes you hear opening up the floodgates or, all, you know, we're going to have a whole, you know, bunch of new cases. I, I don't know, Michelle or somebody else. Um, yeah. No, no, the court doesn't uh, weigh in on that sort of thing. It's just the, imp it, the impact. Would it would it create more um, more cases? Oh, you mean whether or not they would flood the courts? I mean, not, no, I, yeah, no. It's just when it, when I when I go and I hear that it could. Oh, I'm sorry. 
Max, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm trying to help you understand, Ken, why your, your question was, would the, would the court weigh in on this? And, and really the court um, speaks to what the impact um, a proposed law would be on, on the court. And it's usually a matter of resources as opposed to, you know, they, they don't discuss policy. So I'm not sure what, like, why would you, what would you think that, or would, what would you want to hear from the court? I don't want to screw this up. You know, I, I want to make sure that, like, uh, when we were hearing that, you know, that this could go through the crack for la lack of better uh, words or something like that. It's like, this is, this is serious stuff that um, every time I hear about it, I, I, it just, uh, it disgusts me. You know, it's, it's just god awful. And um, I just want to... Um, make sure I'm, I'm not saying we don't do it right, but it's like, I, I just want to close every avenue as possible, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And that's why we certainly need to continue our discussion with the witnesses that are here today and Michelle. Um, and then we can think of if, if there are other practitioners or others that we want to hear from, but um, I don't see any role for the court in this, in this um, discussion. But okay, again, thank you. If somebody else does, you know, chime. If chime I would in. address this concerns, I could come in tomorrow and I could bring in some uh, language that from case law that explains the uh, sort of the, the the process and scope of uh, facial overbreadth and facial invalidity challenge. Because um, I. I think I may not have explained it as clearly as they explain it in case law. And I can just bring in some case law that'll make it clear. Sure, no, you're, you're, you're welcome to continue your, your testimony, absolutely. Other- I make one comment as far as what Ken was asking about, just also for new folks, if they're not completely familiar. Uh, the concept uh, is that a court can't provide an advisory opinion is what it's called. Essentially, they can only rule on cases that are brought before them. They can't uh, provide instruction on how a court might rule on a particular controversy. Uh, they can't tell the legislature that one way or another. So that if that's what you were after on that, Ken. Uh, no, that that's not what it was like. P p what's happened in 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 the past that um, has been learned upon that we don't miss it, so it can happen again. So if somebody slips through the cracks or something like that. Yeah, but I I, I, see, I see Michelle's uh, movements pretty pretty quickly with the with the with the head. So I I think I I understand it. Right. You're very good with that. I've just I've heard Judge Gerson say he's got like a stock line about that or something about no. like the court doesn't no. comment on matters of policy and stuff like that. So I've I've heard that for a number of years. So <laughs> anybody else? Okay, so um I'm hoping. Oh, Mike. Oh, I think he got back in. Great. Because yeah. I was going to say, I don't know how to get us offline <laughs> when it's our time to adjourn. But we um, tomorrow, 15 minutes after the, um, the floor, we will be continuing uh, our discussion on this.